I think more than any other time of year, Christmas has a mood, doesn't it? Christmas has a vibe, it has a feel. The traditions that we all observe have a big part in setting that mood. So the Christmas music fills your ears, the Christmas cookies fill your mouth, the Christmas clothes, which you don't usually wear, like a tie and a suit, cover over your body, you can feel Christmas all around you. The Christmas decorations fill your eyes, and the Christmas books and the stories and the movies fill your imagination. And of course, then there's all the stuff that we actually do, all the trips that we take to see Grandma, all the lights that we see around us. It's all part of the big mood. And that's for good, I think, isn't it? It's a good reason that we celebrate Christmas with all the bells and whistles. After all, Christmas is a big deal. It should be. It's not every day, after all, that the Son of God joins himself to our flesh and blood. It's not every day that our humanity is taken into the divinity. Kind of a big deal, right? It's the kind of thing that calls for a total sensory experience. It's the kind of thing that calls for a feast, For a story, for a song, for special clothes, for special decorations, for special guests, and for special everything. For the Lord comes near. But it's possible, isn't it, to miss that exact point. It's possible to get so caught up in the total sensory experience that we miss the whole point. It is possible and it is pitiful. It is pitiful to have the total sensory experience, to have all the music and the cookies and the clothes and the decorations and the stories and the trips if you don't have Jesus. If you don't have the heart of the matter, the root of the matter, then you can have a great big tree over you, but guess what? That tree is going to come crashing down. And so we need to be taught again and again. We need to be called back always again to the heart of it all. We need to be called back to Christmas, and to the true meaning. And for that this morning, we turn to two rather unlikely fellows. I don't know if all of you figured when you came to church this morning, oh, of course, pastor's going to tell us about John the Baptist, right? That's exactly what was in your minds. Pastor's going to tell us about John the Baptist, and then, of course, the Apostle Paul, because those two, John and Paul, that's what Christmas is all about, right? Right? Well, whether you expected it or not, that's what is in store for us this morning. That's what the church has laid out for us here on the fourth Sunday of Advent. As likely as it may be, John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul are perfect guides for us. They will teach you this morning, even better than any ghost that Charles Dickens could conjure, how to honor Christmas and keep it every day. So first, look at John the Baptist. St. John the Apostle, not the same guy, but St. John the Apostle, the beloved disciple, says he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. With those words, we are meant to clue in that this must be a big deal. This isn't just normal conversation between John the Baptist and his grand inquisitors. It is a confession that is a great witness. It's the kind of thing that can be entered into a courtroom as real, honest-to-God evidence. Now, they came wanting to hear all about John. But apparently, John didn't like to talk about himself. They wanted to know about John, and he didn't want to know about himself at all. And just so, as unlikely as a camel-skin-wearing, locust and honey-eating, baptismal water-pouring, Nazarite from his conception preaching forerunner, John teaches us perfectly about Christmas. John was a big deal. Don't let him fool you. John really was a big deal. But if you asked him, if you asked John, who are you, what are you all about, he would be pretty hesitant to say, well, anything at all. I'm not the Christ. Well, are you Elijah? Nope. You want to talk about yourself, John? Now, usually, right, with us, if anyone asks us to talk about ourselves, we say, how much time do you have, right? Let me tell you all about myself. Let me tell you how special I am. Let me tell you why I'm so important. Let me tell you why you should listen to me. But John, John's not not like that at all. And here is a perfect guide for you this Christmas. 
Don't let John fool you. He really was, he really is a big deal. He was the fulfillment of pro- about prophecy of a great prophet who would appear in the power of Elijah. Elijah, you remember, who was caught up to heaven in a whirlwind. Well, the prophet Malachi spoke of a day when God would send a new Elijah who would appear and prepare the way of the Lord. Isaiah prophesied of someone out in the wilderness crying and building out God's highway. That's who John was. And Jesus would later make the point crystal clear. He would make it obvious, saying that John really is the new Elijah. But see, The whole point of John, the whole thing that makes John such a wonderful guide for us this Christmas, is that he doesn't care about himself. John isn't caught up in who he is and why everyone should pay attention to him and why everyone should make a big deal out of him and why everyone should bring him a present this Christmas. John is entirely obsessed with pointing outside of himself. That's who John is. That's what he's all about. It's as if he's saying to all these people who are coming to ask him questions, why do you care so much about me? Who cares who I am? I am here to prepare the way of the Lord. Why don't you ask about him? Why don't you ask about the one who comes after me? Because compared to him, compared to him, I'm a nobody. And isn't that perfect for us this Christmas? Isn't it perfect for us who get all caught up in making sure that we set the mood, that we have the right vibe, that we have the right feel in our houses, and all of those things have their places, but if we have all of that stuff and we don't have Jesus, what are we doing? John has no interest, does he, in self-promotion and self-praise. John has no interest in self-care and self-love, in self-reflection or self-pity or self-searching and self-image and self-whatever-else it is that you can think of. John is all about pointing to Jesus, speaking of Jesus, dwelling on Jesus. His questioners lack curiosity, don't they? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And the whole time, I imagine John the Baptist feeling like he's slamming his head against a brick wall. Don't you get it? Don't you see? You came out here into the wilderness. You made this big trip to ask about me. I'm nobody special. I'm nothing compared to the one who is coming after me. You're out here asking who I am, and I'm telling you, compared to the one who's coming after me, I'm dirt. The Lord is near. Why don't you ask about him? Here's the way to honor Christmas rightly, to keep it every day. The Lord has drawn near. And not only has he drawn near to us, but he has drawn near as one of us. He loved us with such a love that he wanted to be like you in every way except without sin. And even that, even your sin, your Jesus is willing to carry for you, to bear for you like a lamb to the slaughter. And yet we lack curiosity just like they did. We get so caught up in ourselves, in our traditions, in our moods, in our vibes, in our feels, And we get all distracted. We get distracted and driven by all kinds of trivial matters. The Lord draws near. Let that be the message that is imprinted in your heart and your mind this Christmas. The Lord comes as one of us to be with us, to be like us in every way, sin accepted. And even that, I'm telling you this morning, even that, even your sins and your weaknesses and your frailties and your death and your sorrows, even that your Lord Jesus is willing to bear. So don't lack curiosity. Don't simply be satisfied with having a certain mood or a certain feel, but be satisfied only when, only when you know Jesus and know him better. The Lord is near. The Lord is near and he draws near that you may know him always better than before. That was John's message. And that's also St. Paul's Christmas message for us. You heard it right in the middle of his epistle reading. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone for the Lord is near. So worry less and pray more for the Lord is near. 
And all of this, St. Paul says, is y'all stuff. Rejoice in the Lord, all y'all, he says. Again, I will say, rejoice y'all. It is a collective thing. It's not the kind of thing that you do on your own. It's not the kind of rejoicing that happens somewhere tucked away, secluded in a private room in your house. We often hear John speak, or St. Paul speak that way, don't we? And it's right. We should take his commands as addressed to us individually. But St. Paul never speaks to you individualistically. And there's a big difference, isn't there? You are called to rejoice, each and every one of you. Let none of your mouths be silent this morning or tonight or tomorrow, but you are called to do it with all y'all. Rejoice in the Lord always. After all, we celebrate this day that God has a body. We celebrate this day that the Son of God has come into the world. He has taken our flesh and blood to himself. And so St. Paul calls us to celebrate the Lord in the body. This is the way we keep Christmas the St. Paul way, not with each of us going off to our own private meditation, not even with each of us going off to have happy memories and cute pictures with our own families. There will be a time and a place for all of that to be sure. But Christmas, Christmas is a body of Christ kind of thing. And so we have to come together We celebrate that God, the Son of God, has come in bodily form, that he has not just appeared for a time this way, but that he has come to put on our human form and appear among us with a face, with hands, with feet, with his own voice. So how can we celebrate Christmas apart from his body? And the body that he has come in the flesh to bring is now celebrated in the sacrament of the church. Here in this place, we gather around the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper as the body of Christ. And we rejoice, all y'all, together. Rejoice together then, out loud, with your body and the voice that God has given you. And be reasonable. It's odd, isn't it, that St. Paul says that we should be reasonable and that we have this read right before Christmas. So usually when you think of a Christmas mood or a Christmas vibe, you think of merriness, right? Be merry, be jolly. That's what we usually hear at Christmas. But this morning, St. Paul says that the nearness of the Lord should make us more reasonable. Now, just think of all the things that we do. Is it reasonable for a grown man to climb up on his rooftop and pin multicolored lights to his house? Is that a reasonable thing to do? Is it reasonable for you to go out somewhere, whether it's Lowe's or a Christmas tree farm, and cut down a tree and then bring it inside and then hang a bunch of shiny objects on its branches? Is that reasonable? Is it reasonable to go out and spend a bunch of your hard-earned money on all these people who are going to come into your house? Is that reasonable to wrap it all up and put it under the tree? Be reasonable, we say, when we want someone to see things our way. Or when we're calling someone to be not so extreme, to be not too idealistic. You have to be reasonable. But the reasonableness that St. Paul exhorts you to this Christmas Eve morning is the reasonableness that is defined not by what I think or by what you think, but is defined by the nearness of the Lord. And so I say it's the most reasonable thing in the world to hang lights all over your house. It's the most reasonable thing in the world to put up a tree and put all the tinsel and all the gold and anything else shiny in your house. Hang it on that tree, for the Lord has come near. And so you should have a multi-sensory overload experience For truly, there is no celebration that is too small to bring to our Lord. There is nothing too insignificant to help us celebrate our Lord's nearness. This call to be reasonableness means to see things God's way, to see yourself in the light of Jesus Christ, to lay down your own rights and your own privileges, to lay down your own wants and your own demands, and view your life in his way, and view your neighbor that way as well. That is the reasonableness that Christmas and St. Paul would have you honor and keep, not just today, but all the year round. Be reasonable, which St. Paul further says means worry less and pray more. 
Christmas is a cure for an anxious and worried culture like ours. Is it any surprise to us that in our day and age when church attendance and church involvement and church commitment are waning, that a mental health crisis is waxing? It's not just a correlation, friends. It is a causation. If our souls are adrift from Christ and from his body, the church, then our psyches, which is just the Greek word for soul, are going to be anxious and troubled and worried and fearful and set adrift. And so you come here today and find a holy cure. The gospel is the cure. And here's the gospel. You aren't God. Don't pretend to be. The weight of the world and all of its problems is not yours to fix. It's not yours to bear. Jesus is God, and he has drawn near to you as one of you. He has drawn near to you because he loves you, and so he will be like you in every way except without sin. And what have I been telling you this morning? Even that, even that your Jesus is willing to carry. So let God be God, worry less and pray more, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And do it together, y'all. Corporate, bodily, physical, incarnational worship is essential to Christmas. Let your requests be made known to God together with thanksgiving, together in the body of Christ. Our service is sometimes called the Eucharist. I don't know how often we use that word, but some of you have heard it before. Eucharist means thanksgiving. It's another name we use for the Lord's Supper and its celebration. And that's exactly what St. Paul is calling us to this morning, to a life of Eucharistic praise and worship to a life where you know that you are not alone, where you are here with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you find that here we are not alone, but the Lord is near. He drew near long ago in Bethlehem, and he hasn't left us since. His ascension was not his farewell, but the proof that he now fills all things. And so Jesus comes near to you again today in the Eucharist, to calm your fears, to bear your worries, to bring the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding in the midst of all anxiety. It's a total sensory experience, you know. See and hear then. Take and eat and drink. Pray and give thanks, all y'all together, for here there is a big mood. And it's not one that is crafted with empty traditions, but here the substance and the style are wedded together, never to be separated again, just like our Lord and us. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.